Wise. I'm Mike McMillan from VROC. I'm joined today by Dr. Thomas Merritt from Laurentian University. Good and morning. Colin Jago from the Kortha Pine Ridge District School Board. Hello. Um, our guest. Hello. <laughs> our guest today is Dr. Doug Gray from the Ottawa Hospital Research Institute. And Dr. Gray, to get us started off, can you just uh, give us a little bit of a background about what you do there at the hospital? Okay. So I'm a molecular biologist. Um, I work on diseases of aging and on the biology of aging itself. So uh, the diseases that I work on are, are, are different types of cancer and uh, also the neurodegenerative diseases, uh, dementia and so on. My specialty is in the regulation of protein degradation, so the way in which cells uh, turn over protein, synthesize new protein, replace protein. And in the context of disease and aging, the important uh, thing is uh, the way in which this whole pathway deteriorates and proteins are not efficiently destroyed in the cell in the way that it should be. So that's very important in, in terms of disease, uh, and that's what we're trying to understand. That's awesome. Can I just jump in with a, with a question? So I think a lot of times when, when we're teaching students about even just the, the central dogma of molecular biology, we're really good at explaining you know, what DNA is, what RNA is, what proteins are, and, and the connection across them. Um, and we miss some of the... the Subtleties that we're now finding are not subtleties, but are the things that are driving this. So, I, you know, I don't remember the first time that, that I started learning about protein degradation. We spend a lot of time talking about protein translation. Um, and I know that message uh, RNA degradation, it is an enormous deal, and, and there's a lot of research going on there that I'm more familiar with. But what do we know now that we didn't know 10 years ago um, that's changed about protein degradation and, and its role in fundamentals in biology. Right. So uh, you raised an important point at the beginning there. I see this all the time. Even the, the students I teach always have this uh, concentration on the way in which things are synthesized. And so mm -hmm. if a, the levels of a protein go up and down, they're always thinking about more of it's being produced. And uh, the other side of the equation is always missed. So people don't think uh, at least historically, have not thought enough about uh, how efficiently the protein is being degraded. And it turns out that uh, cells dedicate an enormous amount of their machinery to the regulation of all of this. So it's a really critical uh, system in the cell. And uh, you can see that just by the number of genes in the genome that are dedicated to protein degradation. There are thousands of genes in the genome uh, that encode different components that are part of this pathway that, that regulates protein degradation. So part of the problem is um, there are uh, 10 or 20,000 protein encoding genes. Each of them uh, can produce uh, different uh, numbers of proteins just by alternative splicing and other mechanisms that your students probably know about. So in the cell, at any given time, there may be you know, tens of thousands of different proteins, some of which have to be degraded very quickly, some of which have to persist for a long time. And so mm -hmm. how does the cell know which one's which? And on top of that problem, uh, proteins have to be degraded very quickly when they're damaged. So damaged proteins are very dangerous to the cell. So the cell, in addition to having to be able to distinguish between you know, tens of thousands of different proteins, has to be able to know which ones are looking normal and which ones are actually abnormal. And so it's not surprising that the machinery to do all that is extremely elaborate, uh, and that's part of the reason it's taking us a long time to figure it all out. But, but that's really a statement of the problem. I haven't answered the question of how we do that, but that's really <laughs> just the problem that we're facing. Let me just clarify that problem. That I, I had so you said you shouldn't be surprised, and, and as a molecular geneticist myself, I'm completely surprised. So I mean, we we guesstimate that you know, give, given the, the human genome, we think has somewhere around 20 to 25,000 genes in it. You're saying that thousands of those genes are actually dedicated to pro protein degradation and pro protein removal. So are we talking like 10% of the genome is actually protein degradation and removal? Well, I'm going to pin you down on this. I am 10% of the genome, but um, we know, for example, that the enzymes that, um, that recognize the protein, the ones that are actually doing this by binding to them, uh, we know of, of roughly a 1,000 uh, different genes for that purpose alone. So those are the most abundant mm. ones. Uh, there's other components of the pathway, but so there's at least a 1,000. There's probably 
you know, 1,500, 2,000. We don't actually know the full number, but that's a pretty substantial amount of the total genome already. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a big investment that, uh, uh, that there is in the genome just in, in controlling the, the levels of proteins. That's, that's awesome. I had no idea. That, that is a really phenomenal number for, for, for me to appreciate, let alone students. That's great. For sure. I'm, I'm sitting here, and, and you're right, I'm glad you pointed out the, the, the disconnect between the teaching of how things are synthesized versus how they're, they're degraded, because that, I'm thinking about what we do in high school, for example, and it's all about synthesis. It's all how things are made. It's not necessarily how right. the other side of the equation works, um, which is it's just interesting to me from a, from a high school education point of view. Um, but I'm interested now in the connection between what we're learning, or what you're learning, I guess, with some of these questions about aging in the cell now, because you had talked about that some of these things then cause problems. So how would, say, protein degradation in a cell not going correctly then lead to, to some sort of disease? How does that sort of start to fit together? Okay, so the, the best understood example of that is in the neurons in, in the brain. Neurons have uh, a particular problem um, because they don't divide anymore. So as, sure. as uh, your students will know, with very few exceptions, the neurons that you have are all the neurons that you're going to have. They, they don't get replaced because they, they finish cell division. They're, they're terminally differentiated, as we say. They don't do anything more. So um, the particular problem they have is with garbage disposal, which is really what protein degradation right. you know, can crudely be described as. The, um, the sort of analogy you could think of for a cell like a neuron, uh, well, let's, let's start the other way around. Many of the cells in the body uh, will divide again, and so if they're accumulating garbage, they can divide the garbage between the, the two daughter cells. So, sure. you know, if you are accumulating a lot of junk in your house, um, if you have two children, you can give half of it to each of them you know, your problem has been divided by half, and if each of them have two children, it gets divided further. And sure. But if you're an old man who never got married, you just accumulate all this junk, it never gets divvied up. And so, you know, someday one of the neighbors comes over and sees your whole living room's full of old newspapers and car batteries that you've accumulated over your whole life. That's the problem the neuron has. It can't, it can't get rid of this by dividing it. So we think that's why the problem is particularly acute in, in the neurons. So if they cannot get rid of abnormal protein efficiently enough, it starts to accumulate. And abnormal protein has this property of being sticky. And so it, mm -hmm. it tends to uh, aggregate, form into these clumps, which get larger and larger. And, and we can see these in the brains. Uh, when you look at um, sections from a brain from an autopsy, case from an older individual, even if they have never been diagnosed with any form of dementia or disease, you can see these large accumulated blobs of protein in the neurons in the brain. Mm. And that is really the, the hallmark that's, that's telling you that, that protein degradation has not been working efficiently enough. So you see, you see a number of those in, an, in a normal brain from an older person. If they have a disease like Alzheimer's disease or Parkinson's disease or any of these, they will have a very large number of those large protein aggregates. The, the doctors that specialize in this, neuropathologists, call these inclusion bodies. And the appearance of these and, and the region of the brain in which they're found and, and they're, uh, the part of the cell they're in and all that sort of thing are diagnostic for what type of disease you had. So that's, mm. in an autopsy brain, that's how the neuropathologists know that it's this disease and not another one. But right. all of these diseases have the same feature. They have these big blobs of, of abnormal protein. Okay. So you're, you're giving us really interesting examples from, from mm -hmm. you know, clinical uh, studies, but I, I, I really quickly looked through some of the, the work that you do, and, and I think some of the work you do is, is in model systems. Is that correct? That's right, yes. So, so uh, we do a lot of, of work uh, in mice, and you know, for obvious practical reasons, uh, a mouse uh, in the laboratory, if you take extremely good care of it, as we do, um, will live roughly three years. Uh, a human will live, you know, maybe 100 years if you take very good care of them and they've got the right genes. Uh, 
there are some interesting issues about why that is, and I could talk about that as well if anyone <laughs> is interested. But we use mice you know how you because get those genes. Through, <laughs> yeah, you, you choose your parents carefully. That's <laughs> okay. that's the answer to that. <laughs> uh, unfortunately, there's not not too much you can do in, in that regard. But uh, a three-year-old mouse is very geriatric, and their brains will have all the features of a 100-year-old human mouse, uh, human. And, and that's a really, the, sorry, that's, that's a really neat point, and it's something we've talked about before in, in the, the podcast is, you know, what, what can we do with, with model systems, and why do we work on model systems if, if what we're ultimately interested in is, you know, understanding inclusion bodies in, in, in human, human individuals and how that leads to Alzheimer's or, or dementia. Um, but so your mouse model, does, does an average mouse show these, these same characteristics? Is it a special mouse that you're working on? Yes. Yeah, so uh, an average mouse, um, an average laboratory mouse, uh, will show these when they get, get old enough, certainly. Mice in the wild uh, never live uh, to, to three years. Um, yeah. Mice in the wild, you know, rarely make it beyond a, a year. They, they just... That's not the, the natural order of things. This is a very artificial situation to have mice live that, that long. But, um, but yeah, if you look in a, an older mouse, you will see these things. The interesting thing is that um, we study mice because they are, their brains are actually quite similar to humans. But you can do a lot of this work in even simpler uh, model systems. So a lot of the work in my field is, is done in, in fruit flies. A, a lot of it is, is done in in uh, the nematode model system, these, these simple uh, uh, worm-like creatures, you can actually see this problem of protein aggregation and so on, even in these simpler organisms. And of course, uh, their life cycle is much faster, and mm -hmm. you know, they're, they're much less expensive to work with, and, and there are ethical advantages and, and so on. There we go. So I, I'm preaching to the choir here. Um, you're, you already have a fly geneticist, so... I, I've got a thousand genetics. flies right in front of me, and, and some of these we may have used in an agent study. I'm not sure. I'm not sure if that genotype's here, but yeah, yeah I compl I'm with you. That's that's awesome. Um, may I ask you one more pointy question about that? And, and I think Colin had another question, but um, <clears throat> you mentioned that mice in the wild... So mice in your lab, your lab mice show these advanced systems or symptoms of, of aging. Um, a mouse in the wild never gets past about a year, and so they don't see this. So all of the dementia and, and the things that we're talking about in, in human systems, is this because we're living to unnatural ages? <laughs> well, yeah, unnatural ages, that's, that's uh, an interesting concept. What is a natural age of, of, of a human? The, there are some very profound and important uh, issues in, in that, that question, actually. It's a very loaded question. They, <laughs> it would be interesting to know what what students think a, a natural human age. So th there's actually two issues there. There's life expectancy and there's longevity. So longevity, lifespan, what is the oldest a human could possibly be? You could argue all day about whether it's natural for someone to live that long, but it's a really interesting question. How old can a human be? And right. the record, as you may know, at the moment is 122 years. So there was a woman in You're France. making that up. No. Uh, a woman named Jean Calment, who lived to 122. Wow. Very interesting story there. She, uh, when she was over 100, she made an interesting real estate deal with her landlord, who never expected her to live more than a few few months. She got a very good deal on her her rent because her landlord was 122. <laughs> but in any case, this is the the. This is a documented case, so we know from her birth records and so on. She actually made, there's all kinds of claims. You know, there's some village in in Russia somewhere where people lived to 150. There's right. there's all kinds of stories like this, but this is a case where there's actual documentation. This woman, we know, lived to 122. That seems to be uh, about the maximum. And what's happening, um, you will hear in the news all the time about aging society. You know, people living longer and longer. Mm -hmm. um, the, a greater proportion of the population being older. What's happening is, is um, described in my field as, as making as squaring the, the curve. So you can imagine a survival curve. You know, people, there are fewer and fewer as you get older and older. 
what's happening is the curve is being pushed over towards this limit. So mm -hmm. people aren't going beyond the maximum lifespan that we know about, but more and more of them are, are healthy until a later point, and then their health seems to decline much more quickly. And there's all kinds of interesting issues about what's going on there. Mm -hmm. That's awesome. Yeah, and, and I, I mean, as I, or as you said, it's a loaded question, and, and I'm sorry, I knew that when I asked it. I, I just, you know, it's a kind of, it's a fun thing for the students to think about. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. The, 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 the thing that students may not want to think about, but I'll, I'll tell them anyways, is that um, the, the students in high school have already sort of passed their peak. So, in terms of <laughs> of the maintenance of tissue, of repair, and, and, and so on. Uh, it seems that humans are about at their peak at the point of adolescence. So mm -hmm. once you get beyond adolescence, I'm afraid it's all downhill from yeah. there. <laughs> and <laughs> so there's lots of interesting questions there, you know, in evolutionary terms, why that should be and so on. But this is the big trade-off between reproduction, which is the, in genetic terms, is all that matters, and the amount of resources that you invest into repairing and, and preserving your tissues and keeping everything in working order. So once you get to the point you know, where you're, you're old enough to reproduce, then the amount of investment in, in repairing everything has diminishing returns. And so right. that's the, the sort of dogma these days for the mm. explanation for why we age at all. Why is this even necessary? Absolutely. That, that's awesome, Colin. I, I was going to interrupt, but, yeah. but I'll try not no, to. No, that's Go fine. Ahead. That's fine. No, that's, it's great because, because those kind of questions are, are really good drivers of curriculum. <laughs> they're, they're really good drivers in a classroom to get people to think about, about the, the science and the biology and the biochemistry that underlies some of these questions, right? And, and it, it's, in a, it's a, an approach that you know, we use all over Ontario to, to get kids interested in that. It strikes me that some of the questions you're asking are really simple, but the answers are really complex. Um, and so I'm biology. sitting here thinking, yeah, no kidding. And I'm sitting here thinking about, you know, so your, your average uh, biology student in grade 11 or 12, who can, and at a very at a very good level, understand the concept of homeostasis and protein synthesis and now protein degradation and how it all sort of fits together. I'm wondering if there's any way in um, high school that they can actually ask questions and start to do hands-on type of experiments, projects, research, basic kind of things that that you know, would, would impact their understanding and you could actually do in a high school setting. Like you talked about, you know, fruit flies versus human systems and that sort of thing. Have you ever thought anything about how you could work in a high school to help kids actually dig into some of these questions? Yeah, well, um, I wish I had a, a good answer to that. I'm at a bit of a disadvantage because I don't I guess actually it's know complex. <laughs> what kind of resources you have in high school these, sure. these days. I could tell you that... Um, I've gone as far in talking about model systems as, as nematode worms, but some of these processes even happen in, in bacteria, even in E. coli. Mm. So there are experiments you mm. can do on a, a petri dish to wow. to get at, at, at some of these questions. So I think the, the short, uninformed answer is um, that there are things that, that, that you can probably do, uh, right. even at a high school level, to, to begin to get at the question of protein stability and, and protein degradation. There's actually a lot of interesting thought experiments that you can do as a, as a starting point. So okay. you can think about what kind of proteins uh, would you imagine need to last a very long time? What kind of proteins would you want to have um, a very mm -hmm. short sort of half-life, turn over very quickly? There's lots of really interesting concepts there. and. Um, so one of the examples I like to lecture on is um, uh, the, the proteins in the lens of the eye, for example, the crystalline mm -hmm. proteins in the eye. Mm -hmm. these, these are proteins that have to last essentially your entire life. And it, you, you can think about what kind of experiment could you do to figure out how long those proteins uh, actually last. Um, okay. Because people have wondered about that, it's because the the lens has to be transparent. You can't have a lot of stuff in the way of the the sure. light path. So even things like you know the nucleus of a cell could interfere with with light. So the, there are cells in there in the lens of the eye, 
but they are maximally transparent. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways they do that is that they don't they don't turn over protein. They don't have all the machinery to do that in the way of the, the light. So the proteins there have to last a very long time. So how would you measure how long those proteins last? And if you're interested, I'll give you the answer because it's I think it's really <laughs> interesting. And it turns out that sure. I'm I'm of, of the act age to answer this question. So here's the answer. There's I have nothing to do with this. There's some very clever people that, that figured this out. If you were of my age, you were born at a time when uh, the Americans and the Soviet Union were testing atomic bombs by blowing them up above ground. So they would just right. blow them up, and all of the radioactivity would go up into the atmosphere and get scattered over the whole planet. And if you happened to be an embryo, as I was during this time, your mother would be inhaling air that had radioisotopes in it from these atomic bombs. That would get incorporated into all of your proteins in your body, including the lenses of your eye. Wow. And now you're doing a, a radioactive isotope decay experiment because, mm. because all of that radiation is in there. It's not If the proteins never get replaced, then all of that radioisotope is just going to decay using very predictable radioactive decay. Mm -hmm. So when that person dies, um, you can take the lens out and measure the amount of radioisotope in, in, in these proteins. Wow. So if the proteins get turned over, you would expect there to be less than would be predicted just by radioactive yes. decay. If the proteins never got replaced, then there would be precisely the amount you would expect by radioactive decay. And, and the answer is, I've, I've given it away, the answer is, is the latter. Mm. It's exactly what you'd expect if there was protein incorporated when you were an embryo with radioisotope in it, and then just decayed, given by the half-life of wow. the isotope. And that's how we know that the, the protein in the lens of the eye never gets replaced. Whatever you've got is all you're going to have. And if it, if it starts making these clumps, you end up with a cataract in your eye, and you mm -hmm. can't see through oh. it anymore. Okay. That's the problem. The protein doesn't get replaced. So that's the, the, the kind of question that you can think about. It. Yeah, yeah. The, the crystalline story is, is, is an awesome story from, as an evolutionary geneticist. Um, so you, you've got this, the lens of the eye, and literally the lens is made simply of proteins that are so overexpressed that they crystallize out of solution. It, it's like taking so much salt in a, a salt solution that the salt starts to fall out of solution and precipitate. Right. Right? So you crystallize these proteins, and that makes the lens. That's what makes the lens of the eye. So you'd think this would be a really funky protein that is specially adapted to that particular function. It's not. And not the protein yet. involved varies from organism to organism to organism. Now, all humans have the same protein, and I'm actually blanking what it is, but ducks use a different protein to make their lens than mm. humans do. And, and other organisms use yet another protein. And so what's happened is, is through evolution, the, lens, the protein that makes the lens always has the same function, but the gene that codes for that protein is different. And it's a, it has been a really mind-blowing experiment to try to figure out you know, how that evolves, because the, the lens didn't evolve multiple times, but right. we've got independent recruitment of different proteins in, in different groups. Um, but this idea that the thought experiment is awesome, you know, how long do the proteins have to live? I mean, one of the thought experiments that, that students can, can think about is why do we have to age? Right? There, there really doesn't, there doesn't seem to be a reason. We, we are really good at repairing, but repair breaks down. So why does repair break down? Why haven't we evolved a more efficient system that, that can efficiently repair longer than just to, to adolescence? Um, and it, I mean, it's something that I don't think we have an answer for now, but there, there are lots of people thinking about it. Absolutely. Yeah. And then the flip side of that is how do we then promote more repair? Because in my mind, you know, promoting those those proteins that code for degradation to then encourage that to continue would then potentially increase lifespans, right? Because what we need right. is 8 million people with even longer lifespans. That's 8 billion, <laughs> sorry, 8 billion people. <laughs> well, no, so I don't think um, many people in my field are all that interested in increasing the lifespan. What we're trying to increase is something that people call health span. So, yeah. okay. you know, we don't necessarily want to live to be 150, but we want to be healthy until we reach, you know, sure. a, a good ripe old age. So what you don't want to do is, is push out the further limit and just have 
an extra 20 years of, of poor health. What we really want to do is, is keep people healthy as long as we can. And so the, the earlier point, you know, how do we do this? How do we increase repair? How do we in increase the efficiency of protein degradation, in my case? Mm -hmm. That's what, what we're all trying to, to solve. And so, you know, how are we doing this? Not very well. It's, it's, a, very, it's a very difficult, complicated problem. It, it's interesting. The one intervention um, that I, I'm sure you'll all know about that seems to increase the health and, in some cases, extend the lifespan of, of model systems is, is caloric restriction. So if you mm -hmm. actually just reduce the amount of calories in the diet by roughly 30%, you can see in fruit flies and in, in, in the nematode worms, in yeast, in, um, in mice even, uh, a very s significant improvement in health and lifespan. So that's the reduction in calories uh, is the amount that you need uh, to live uh, so you're not starving, but, but not much beyond that amount. So uh, the question is, how does this work? And there's a lot mm -hmm. of science going on trying to figure out how it works. One of the things it does is actually increase the efficiency of, of protein uh, mm -hmm. degradation. So it, it does work in that way. There's not a lot of people uh, who are willing to reduce their <laughs> the amount of calories they eat by 30%. I mean, that's pretty substantial. Although these people do exist. Yeah. I've met some of them. They, mm. The ones I've met, at least, seem very unhappy. Uh, <laughs> they, they actually, they eat all the time. They, they carry around backpacks yeah. full of food, and they have a, a scale for weighing things out. But the food that they're eating has very little caloric content, mm, so yeah. it's a lot of greens and, and mm -hmm. you know, egg whites and things like that. <clears throat> and they're cold. They have trouble maintaining their, their body good. heat. Right. So they, it's, it's not a very happy lifestyle for people. And... Uh, as it stands, there's no evidence that this is even going to work in, in people. It, it works in mice, but mice have a very different sort of evolutionary history than, than humans um, in terms of their access to, to food and, and so on. So mm -hmm. what people are looking for, obviously, is a drug that will simulate the effect of caloric restriction because people are willing to take a pill every day. They're not willing to <laughs> eat 30% less, less right. calories. But even so, it's not clear it's, it's going to work, and I'm very skeptical of that whole approach. But mm -hmm. all that being said, it, it works in model systems, and we really need to understand the mechanism, and it's not surprising there's a lot of people working on that. Well, guys, I think that we're uh, unfortunately all out of time this morning. Mm -hmm. But uh, Dr. Doug Gray, thanks very much for your time today. It's good. Yeah, Doug, thank you very much. And I think that's an awesome place to, to leave it. I mean, it, the, the caloric restriction stuff is, yeah. is interesting. Um, and like you say, unfortunately, people aren't going to cut down on their calories. But if we can find a way to duplicate those effects uh, in, in a pill form, people are really good at taking pills. Thank you very much for being well, here. I appreciate it. Thanks, Doug. Okay. It's been great. Thanks. And thanks, Thomas and Colin, as well. Bye, everyone. Thanks a lot.